everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living with Chef AJ. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is J.L. Fields. J.L. is a vegan lifestyle coach and educator, food for life instructor, co-creator of Real World Vegan Meal Plans, personal chef, career coach, and a corporate consultant offering wellness training, brand representation, and strategic planning services. She is the author of Vegan Pressure Cooking, Beans, Grains, and One Pot Meals in Minutes, co-author of Vegan for Her, The Woman's Guide to Being Healthy and Fit on a Plant-Based Diet, contributor to Running, Eating, Thinking, a vegan anthology, and writes monthly vegan dining reviews for Colorado Springs Gazette and is a food, health, and wellness freelance writer. That's a lot. When do you have time? <laughs> you really are. You're a busy gal. <laughs> That just made me tired. <laughs> I know, just just reading it. So I'm very excited to discuss your new book, Vegan Pressure Cooking, and I'm very grateful that you wrote it because, J.L., I love pressure cooking. People are always, when are you going to write a pressure cooking? Cause, okay, now, I, now I don't have to because you've done it for me, so I really appreciate that, and a beautiful book it is. But before we talk about the book, let's talk about you because I'm not sure all my listeners are familiar with you. So tell me a little bit about your plant-based journey. Okay, um, and thanks for having me, Chef AJ. My you pleasure. Know, um, I adore you. I love seeing you and we're at Veg Fest, and um, we have a lot of fun together. And um, and I, you're so generous. Like when I, when people say write a cookbook, you're like, I don't need to. Jill Nissenow and Jay O'Neill are doing that, so don't worry about it. So exactly. I think that's hilarious. Thank you. <laughs> um, I appreciate you guys doing all the work for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, you do plenty. You do plenty. <laughs> Um, so here's my journey. I'm actually going to be turning 50 in a couple of months. And the only reason that's really significant is, um, well, the heck, it, it is significant. But anyway, uh-huh. it, I, 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 as it goes to my journey is this, you know, like when I was in my late 30s, I, um, I lived in New York and I was a couch potato. I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. I... Um, My favorite dessert was a Baby Ruth's candy bar after dinner. You know, health kind of wasn't my thing. I was busy (laughs) working. I was working in the nonprofit sector, and, you know, you kind of get caught up in that, like, I'm working so hard and and everything's so stressful and um, whatever. I deserve a Baby Ruth at night after dinner, whatever. So um, I led led an organization that worked in violence against women and girls, and we were in Africa. Um, And, again, this is in my late 30s. We were in Africa. And we were there to open a safe house for girls who were fleeing female genital mutilation. And it was this beautiful, yeah, really intense, right? But a really auspicious occasion. Like, you know, the community had come together and women had rallied and built this house where, you know, there were going to be 50 beds for the girls and 50 desks for them to continue their education since they weren't going to have to go through this, um, through this, this cultural part of their coming of age. And so it was a really wonderful occasion. And then all of a sudden in this, um, in this celebration, a male elder came into the event, and he was leading a goat. And the female elder said, you know, this is really huge. This is, he is essentially bringing up his most prized possession. This would be like his Mercedes Benz. And he's saying he's welcoming this change in our community. So it was very great news, right? And then they uh, slaughtered the goat, stewed the goat, and we ate the goat for dinner. Oh, my. And I became I became a vegetarian that night. Wow. After dinner. Wow. Uh, so that kind of started a trajectory that I hadn't expected. And listen, I'm from Iowa. I understand where <laughs> meat came from, you know, but it was something about I met a goat, I shook his hoof, and then I ate him, but it just was a little um, yeah, that's destroying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of started this crazy journey where, you know, I actually called my husband from the airport on my way to South Africa, and I said, you know, I've become a vegetarian. And a lot of people are like, why'd you call him? And he did the cooking. <laughs> He did the cooking back then. I needed him to know that suddenly he had a vegetarian in the house. And by the time I got home from Africa, he was pressing tofu. He was making vegetarian dishes. He totally took care of it. Um, And then I, you know, kind of did that vegan journey or vegetarian journey, you know, where you kind of like, oh, well, what about fish? Oh, wait, no, not fish. And what about this? What about that? And over that time period, I started running races. I started running uh, 10Ks. Then I run half marathons. Then I ran full marathons. Then I became a triathlete and totally shifted, you know, everything about my health and my perspective, but I hadn't gone vegan yet. And then um, five years ago, I went vegan, and my husband was like, listen, you are on your own. You've got to figure this out. (laughs) So I started cooking at the age of 45. So I've been in the kitchen 
for just a few years fumbling my way trying to figure out how to be a healthy vegan. And, um, and you know, for me that like healthy me, you know, I'm, I'm rounder and I'm bigger than I was when I was, um, a marathoning vegetarian. I've, I've kind of gone through this body. Um, I don't know, you know, just kind of like feeling differently toward my body and feeling more about nurturing it. And, and I'm, you know, finding my way through that health journey. And, um, so suddenly I started writing a blog and then I wrote cookbooks because the pressure cooker saved my hind in. I had yep. no idea what I was doing in the kitchen and it was a game changer. It helped me figure out how to make decent meals in a matter of minutes because I'm one of those people who think she's too busy to cook. So that's it. That's my story. Yeah, you know, <laughs> pressure, I, can't, I can't agree with you more about pressure cooking being a game changer. And if nothing else, I hope this call inspires people to get one because it's so easy. And it's like I don't even like to cook the other way anymore. It's like who I wants know. to, you know, it's almost 100 here in L.A. I don't, and I'm having company for dinner before the screening of Dr. Campbell's new movie. And it's like I don't want to turn the oven on when it's 100. And, you know, pressure cooking is awesome. And you can take it with you on vacation. And you can cook in your hotel. And, it's it, you know, we, there's that guy, the plant plant fuel trucker he cooks in his truck with a pressure cooker i know isn't that amazing it's so true and don't you find that people think oh well pressure cooking makes a lot of sense in the winter because they think of like chili and stew mm-hmm. and i've been telling i've been teaching classes for the last couple of weeks and i'm like you guys you don't get it this is our summer appliance too because we do not have to have the heat on in our house that long if you're using a traditional stovetop pressure cooker and you soaked your beans overnight you're only using a heating element on your stove for about 12 minutes and if you're using an electric pressure cooker, you're using you're adding no heat to your kitchen and still only cooking for about 12 minutes. So it's actually the perfect appliance in the summer. It's so perfect that at one point I had five of them, but I am down to three now because I felt five was excessive. <laughs> you don't want to know how many I have. <laughs> really? Oh, are you like in the Kathy Hester Club? I think she has something like 12. I interviewed her. She's another gal that loves pressure cooking. Yeah, I have a lot, and then I started a vintage collection, so I actually have a bunch of vintage ones that I can't use that are really super cool, the ones that scare everybody, Mm -hmm. and then I have the ones that, you know, I can actually use, electric and stovetop, and it's pretty ridiculous. When did you first uh, get into pressure cooking? It was about a year, uh, probably four years ago. When I went vegan, um, I would, like I said, I was, it was the year I turned 45, and I started reading a lot of blogs, and that's actually how I found you, um, AJ, was because I you know, was trying to figure out, I don't know how to eat. I have no idea what I'm doing. So I just scoured the internet for good information, videos, blog posts, books, and started reading a lot of people. And Jenna Hamshaw, who writes the blog, um, choosingraw.com, mm-hmm. one weekend, um, I think it was like actually a Monday morning, she had a blog post that said, well, my boyfriend and I on Saturday night, we're sitting around, we didn't know what to make for dinner. So we just pulled out two pressure cookers and made brown rice in one black beans in another, and we were eating dinner in 30 minutes. And I'm like, what the heck is this magical device? I need yeah. this. It's and funny. I ordered one online. Yep. Um, well, I ordered... you, which one was your first one? The Presto with that jiggly top. So so yours was a stove top. So my first one was the yeah. Pleasing Art because it was $69 at Costco, and I figured for 69 bucks, it's not a big deal, even if it's not the greatest thing. And it was, and then I graduated on to the Instant Pot because I wanted a stainless steel insert and, you know, yogurt maker and all that kind of stuff. And, man, it's like it, it really did. It has changed my life. It has changed my eating. It just makes everything so simple. It really does. And I think you actually bring a really good point up about those inserts because that comes up a lot. I've been using a lot of different um, – you know, my book came out in January, so I've, I just finished a six-month book tour, and um, I've been using a lot of different kinds of pressure cookers, and um, Fagor I've been using just because, you know, they were one of my sponsors. But I have learned, no matter what device I'm using, that if, I, if it comes with a Teflon insert, it's pretty easy to go onto Amazon and find a stainless steel insert, even if yeah. you don't um, so I'm just, you know, just in case people don't want to pay $130 for a device right. and they want to buy something a little less. So that that is an, an option, too, because I agree with you. I, I really don't like the tough one. I prefer yeah. the stainless well. Well, it, it, does, it does tend to scratch after a while. And I personally, it doesn't exactly. bother me. But then every now and then when I would do a demo, people are like, well, I'm not going to eat that. It was made in Teflon. So it just, it just got Exactly. Eaten. What do, the, what do the, the inserts run on online when you're just buying an insert? How much do those About- cost? About 20 bucks. That's not bad. So, yeah, that's it's not, not bad. bad. And, and that's why when people ask which one to get, what I tell them is sit down and do a little math and just ask yourself this. You're like, okay, you have your budget, but now let's look at them. Like like the Cuisinart, that, that, by the way, the $69 is a really good deal. I think the Cuisinart is right now at most of the stores that you got yours at Costco are, are yes. probably like around $89. Right. That's still pretty good. Note. 
So if you're mm-hmm. going to add this in the stainless, now you've moved up to $100. So that's $100. You could buy an Instant Pot Lux, which is uh, comes with a stainless, and it's a rice cooker, slow cooker, and a pressure cooker, and a yogurt cooker, yep. or a yogurt maker, and that's going to be about $130. So now you're paying $30 more to get what you did once you added on your stainless. And so maybe you do want to spend that extra $30 and get three other appliances out of the deal. So, Absolutely. you know, you just kind of ask, ask yourself that question. Don't, what do they say? Don't rob Peter to pay Paul. Like, you exactly. know, kind of crunch the numbers a little bit. And, you know, if they use my name, AJ, they get $50 off an instant pot. Mm. It ends up being the same price as the cuisine art. So maybe that would be an incentive for them to get the, that model so they can do, you know, have the rice cooker, have the yogurt maker, that kind of thing. Good point. That's how I got my first one was with your code. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, uh, you know, the way I found you, JL, is a while back I was Googling, I wanted to make a broth, and you have oh, yeah. recipe, and it's actually in your book. You actually have two broth recipes in your book, and I can't wait to try the second one where you added fruit. That sounds amazing. But the, the one made from scrap, this was years ago because I asked if I could put it in my next book because I thought it was so yep. brilliant because I hate wasting things. And every time you peel a red onion or have the core of the bell pepper, I just it always kills me, to, or the knob of the celery, it always killed me to throw it out. And when I learned from your blog that you can just, Fill a, a Ziploc, a gallon-sized Ziploc bag with these scraps, and when it's full, just throw it in the pressure cooker with some water and a few spices, and you have broth. You have saved me so much money off those cartons. Oh, I'm so glad. And, you know, it's funny. I actually think I, 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 I think I read that from somewhere else, and then I just started adding kind of like my own approach to it. So like some people use potatoes in their stock, which I don't do that. But that's a great point for anybody who's listening, um, if you've been wanting to play around with making vegetable stock, because I would like to say I'm that person who does, like, um, composting, and I don't. Um, <laughs> and so this is how I feel better about what's happening in my kitchen. And is when you're in your kitchen and you're just chopping and slicing and dicing every time you're getting ready to make a salad or you're prepping your vegetables for the week, just save all of those ends and those peels, you know, the, the peel to your garlic, the peel to your onion, the ends of your celery and carrot. Tomatoes are amazing. I always make sure no matter I, – I usually have a couple of bags going in my freezer, mm-hmm. and I always make sure there's something with acid in one of them, whether it's a little bit of a leftover lemon or a lime or tomato or even an orange. Um, and so, so I want a little bit of that, and, and then just try to stay away from the cabbage family because those can get a little bitter. As much as I love my beloved kale, I have, I have made some very bitter vegetable broth mm-hmm. using that or, you know, throwing in some Brussels sprouts. So. But I want to tell you, because I think you'll appreciate this because you are a chef, is that other recipe, that fruit, you know what that came from? I had a good friend who was a chef in New York, and um, he was really vegan-friendly, but not a vegan. And his restaurant was far from vegan. But he made a point to have a vegan option in every single course of his menu, and he marked it very, very clearly. So we became friends because, of course, I want, I want to be best friends with anybody who will do that for us, right? And he came out, we were talking about broth, and I told him about my scraps, and he's like, ah, that's terrible. You should never make broth from scraps. And of course, he's a chef, so he's teasing me, but that's he funny. was the one who told me that adding fruit, when you're making a broth, if you're going to make a soup, and especially now because it's summer, right? When you're making a soup in the summer, you're not making one of those dark brown, reddish kinds of stews. You're probably making things that are a bit more colorful and clear and yellow and bright because of the seasons. And he said, and when you're thinking about what vegetables and produce you put in your broth, think dark colors for dark soups and think light colors for lighter soups. And when you're thinking about a light, fresh, creamy soup, uh, you know, maybe with some corn or asparagus, Peaches and apples are a great addition to the broth, and he's right. I mean, that and that's what inspired that recipe. So it's really fun to save. So I now, of course, I still use scraps, but I use fruit scraps. <laughs> right. Well, it's it's so great because, like you, like you say, I don't compost because I live in an apartment, so those scraps go in the bag. And not only do I save money because those boxes of broth are like four dollars for four cups, and some of my soup recipes calls for twelve cups of broth, which would be then twelve dollars. But I like that it tastes a little bit different every time. You know, it's always yeah. good, but it tastes a little bit different if I have parsley one time, or you know, I I just I just think it's like it's brilliant. So thank you so much for that recipe, and I can't <laughs> wait to try the fruit one. You know, I know. Notice you have a, quite a few jackfruit recipes in your cookbook. Now, I've eaten jackfruit, but I've never worked with it. So tell me a little bit about jackfruit and, and what it does and how you work with it. Yeah, so I heard about, you know, jackfruit kind of hit the blogging world a couple of years ago. People got really excited about it, particularly people who eat plant-based or vegan, because people 
discover that jackfruit, when you cook it, actually begins to have the consistency. You can tear it, and it has the consistency of what many of us may remember as pulled pork mm-hmm. um, or a pulled, pulled meat sandwich. And so I started playing around with it because my husband and I were not on the same journey. He is now a vegan. That took, you know, we, were, we weren't at the same place, and for a couple of years we even referred to him as the reluctant vegan. <laughs> and so I, I was always trying to find things that um, there would be uh, like food memories for him, but not just always relying on, you know, the stuff that we can find in the dairy section or whatever, or the produce section that has like the, the chauffeur keys. Not that I'm opposed to those, but I wanted him to kind of branch out a little bit, right? Uh-huh. So I started playing around with the jackfruit. And what was really fun was just I just used it in the pressure cooker because I'm like you. I'll do anything in the pressure cooker first until my pressure cooker tells me, proves to me it won't work. And it did work. And so I just very quickly, like in three minutes, put um, jackfruit that is canned, by the way. I've only used canned, and I've only used canned in a water. So the tricky thing about jackfruit is if you're going to buy some, you'll probably find it at an Asian market. Some Whole Foods or natural stores, um, natural food stores may carry it, but often it's packed in syrup, and that's not what you want. You want mm-hmm. the one that's packed in water. And in some ways, it, it, it's like tofu in the sense that it's going to taste like however you season it. So in my book, I have two recipes where I really I go for the gusto with the seasoning, like mustard seeds and mm-hmm. cayenne pepper. And so one is an enchilada recipe, and one is like a pulled pork sandwich recipe. So there's tomato, you know, for that acid. And I cook it at three minutes, and it's done. I mean, it's really quick, and I just use my fork, and I pull it, and it shreds. And so it has that kind of food memory when you look at it. It's got that chewy texture, and it's got that um, – the flavor, although those really intense flavors, but obviously much lighter than if you were eating meat. Sure, and, and much better for you. So how did your That's husband finally uh, join the join the tribe? What was his <laughs> Well, it's funny. He's been, you know, what I always said was I definitely had my profound moment with a goat, and then I went on my journey for a few years, so I went completely vegan. And he was going to have to have his moment. And some people would say to me, you know, I can't believe your husband's not a vegan. You're a vegan lifestyle coach. And I'm like, listen, if my husband ever walked into this house, said he had some profound moment and whatever he had just learned or experienced or decided to be that he had, that I needed to be that too. I'd be like, dude, you married a feminist. Don't you tell me what to do. So I was really trying to be respectful of that. But I will confess that, um, you know, when we moved to, uh, when we moved from uh, New York to Colorado, he said, you know, I'll be vegetarian now in the house. And I'm like, cool, that was a nice, I didn't ask, and that mm-hmm. was great. And then we bought um, we bought a condo a couple years ago, and he's like, okay, the house will now be 100% vegan. Everything in our house, food, cl- you know, clothing, everything is vegan. So I'm like, that's cool. So last summer I was in um, the PCRM, Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine's Food for Life training. And, you know, and that's a, tra- a training that is designed for lay people like me, although there are lots of medical professionals who take it, but it's designed for people like me who already teach cooking classes to go out and to be able to teach cooking nutrition classes, which isn't to say that I'm a nutritionist, nor do I try to play one on TV, but (laughs) instead I can use the PCR materials and have a group of people in a room and just show them how to cook healthfully, right? So I'm sitting in the classroom in Washington, D.C., and Neil Bernard, Dr. Bernard, is up talking, and he's talking about prostate cancer. He's talking about um, tomatoes and how men who consume cooked tomatoes at least twice a week, cooked, not raw, um, are, were showing that they had a 20, over 20% less likelihood of getting prostate cancer. Hmm. And my father-in-law died of prostate cancer. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, so I texted my husband, and I said, uh, this is literally a year ago. It popped up on my Facebook this week. It was so funny because I had taken a picture, a screenshot of it, and I said, hey, remember when I told you I wanted you to have that moment on your own about veganism? <laughs> and there's no, there's no comment, right? And then I was like, well, I think I might have just had this moment for you. And well, there's still no comment. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, I just want you to try 21 days when I get home. And you know, when you're on your iPhone or on your, when you're on mm-hmm. text and you just see that dot, dot, dot. So you know that something's happening on the other end and you don't know what. Oh. <laughs> so I'm just sitting there waiting. And he said, okay. So I came home from DC. He did the 21 day challenge. And then coincidentally at the end of that 21 day challenge, we were in Denver to see Cowspiracy. It was the first showing 
of the film Cowspiracy in Colorado. And on our drive home, he said, okay, that got me. He's like, the environment argument got me in a way that the other pieces didn't. He said, I'm, I'm going to do this. And so it was just kind of those two combination of those two things in synchronicity, I guess. But that's what happened. That's fantastic. Because, you know, so many people in my Ultimate Weight Loss Program are in what we call mixed marriages, and, and, and they have kids as well. And it, and I don't, because my husband is vegan, when I married him 20 years ago, he wasn't. But I said right away that um, – I'm vegan. There's not going to be any food that's not vegan in the house. The wedding's going to be vegan. If there's kids, they're going to be vegan. You can do what you want. And then, you know, it was just a matter of time. You heard Dr. McDougall speak. He went vegan the next meal. But I was, was, it, was it difficult? Like, I mean, because once, you know, it's like when you find it, you know how great it is and you want people you love to do it too. So yeah. obviously you couldn't force him because that wouldn't have worked. But like, was did, were you kind of hoping that he would eventually um, become one? Oh, absolutely. Because you know, you know about you know for me that that first and foremost, my veganism is, veganism is around the animals, and mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, it means so much to me. And and I will tell you that what because I I work with a lot of people who I like that you call it mixed marriages, and and I call it multi bore home. <laughs> so we've got like and oh, um well, that's cute. And so and that and that's probably you know with with the coaching that I do, probably the number one issue that comes up, particularly when I'm working with women is the struggle of, well, I don't think I can go vegan because everybody else in my family, you know, no one else is doing it, to which I always say, your veganism or plant-based, however you want to call yourself, needs to be about you. And so let's focus on you first and let's find a way for you to negotiate what's happening in your household. And I, and I feel like that was what we were trying to do ourselves. And he was always really respectful. He knew how passionate I was about it. He, you know, our philanthropy went to animal rights groups when he was not a vegan or even vegetarian. And, and he was with me on those decisions to give money to help rescued animals. And so he was always, you know, very supportive in that way. And then frankly, he's a great cook. And so what happened was even before he identified as vegetarian and then, you know, before he moved toward veganism, he would make all kinds of delicious vegan meals for me. And so I think that as he started to kind of have fun in the kitchen like I was, like, hmm, I used to love this. How could I make this in a healthy, plant-based way? Um, I think that that became an enjoyment for him as well. So I think that that really did aid to the process. And for us, really, in that transition time was trying to find really kind of helpful, um, playful, delicious ways to give him what we always kind of refer to as food memories. And, mm-hmm. um, and that worked. That worked for us. Well, I'm, well one, I'm so happy that, that he has joined us. What do you think his reticence was at first? Like just he just loved his meat too much or, or just um, what, what do you think it took a little bit of time to get him there? Because what, what, I'm just trying to help other people that are in this situation. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's the love of me. I think that people, this is my opinion, and then I'd really love to hear yours too. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's the place where it's easy to say that it's like, well, I'm not going to give that up. That's, a, that's what I eat. That's a part of my helpful diet. And I don't believe that's true all the time. What I really think is that two, two distinct things have happened. One, like kind of going on the easy side of things is, wait, you've just like, this is all I've ever known. This is a habit that goes into my body and I don't know another way to think about it and I don't even want to have to think about it. That's, that's one thing. And it is true. I mean, our, 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 lives, our lives, especially now in this day and age, doesn't it seem like everything revolves around food, even our social activities, like let's all get together for dinner. This, so we're always thinking about what we put in our food and we've just challenged somebody to say, you know, we want you to put an entirely different thing in your mouth. But I don't think it's that. I think that when people say that vegans are um, obnoxious or in your face or whatever, most of the time I think when, when it comes up that we say that we eat a plant-based diet or that we're a vegan, um, and probably most times pretty lovingly or nonchalantly because somebody offered you like whatever, a ho-ho, and you don't eat ho-hos, you know. It's not like we, we go, ah, I'm a vegan. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't eat that, you know, but thank you for offering it. And then they'll say, why? And you say you're vegan, and then everyone says, oh, you know, what does a vegan do? How do you know who the vegan is in the room? Because they told you. Because they but told they you. Exactly. And, and let me just point yeah. out that I was obnoxious and in your face before I was vegan, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, people would say the same thing about me, too. So I like that. Exactly. It has to do with being me. Just, just, uh, anything, it has to do with being an Aries. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, but what I really think is when we tell somebody, um, because I choose not to eat animals, then what, what we just said was, you know, it, it, 
it makes them re- they think about what they're putting in their mouth, and they're like, oh, I'm choosing to eat an animal. And I think that people get mad at us for that when it really has very little to do with us, and we just actually gave somebody something to think about, and it's an uncomfortable feeling because it really does challenge what most of us, because most of us before we were vegan were not vegan. The challenge is what most of us were brought up with, what our parents lovingly put on the table for us, what we enjoyed making, whatever that is, and that's a big challenge, and I think that that's where I think a lot of the issue comes up is just like this sort of just not wanting to have to deal with what that means because if because once you do you have to step it all the way back from the packaging you got at the grocery store to what happened to it before it became in that package and what a lovely being it was before all of those other horrible things happened to get it in the package that it had brown eyes and eyelashes and and frolic and and knew you know could could almost smile with you know excitement and and compassion and I think that that is hard for people. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 we have something else in common. In your book, in your introduction, in your pre- vegan pressure cooking book, you said that your first uh, cr- pressure cooking cookbook was Great Vegetarian Cooking Under Pressure by Lorna Sass. Mine, too. Yeah. I found yeah. that a wonderful book. I'd love to interview her sometime. And, and, like, those recipes are so good that you don't, like you say, you don't have to be vegan to enjoy them. They're just delicious, just like yours, you know. That's the thing. Pe- people that aren't vegan will eat these recipes. Right. It's a great book. The, that Herbs to Vervon split pea soup, isn't that divine? Yeah, I love and my, I, I love her Thai chickpeas the best, and she is, that's where I learned to make my own coconut milk because she has a recipe how to do it yourself. Oh, how to yeah. Which I love. And my understanding is that book actually won a James Beard Award, and I think it's the only vegan cookbook to ever do that. So that's that's quite an accomplishment. And you credit Jill. Jill, I know I'm going to be interviewing soon. Jill Nussenau, she's also the yep. veg queen, also the pressure cooking queen. I, and I just think it's great because, you know, I've been vegan almost 40 years now, and people say, wow. that, then they, yeah, they can't be vegan because it, they don't have enough time and they don't have enough money. But when you get a pressure cooker, you save time because there's no time to make anything. I mean, you to make everything in no time at all, and you save money because when you buy cans of beans, and I do buy cans of beans, I mean, but they're still 89, 99 cents more if they're organic. You could make like four pounds for that price in your pressure cooker, you know. Exactly. I mean, that's what I tell people. Like, cause, like, listen, I have cans of beans in my cupboard, too, because there are days where I just, all of a sudden, I'm making a salad, and I just want to drain some beans and put them on my salad. And But I, I so agree with you. And I think that, because what, what a lot of people forget, too, is that if you want to try a new bean or a new grain, you might buy a pound of it or a box of it and then discover you don't like it. But if you go into the bulk section mm-hmm. of a store that has those bulk bins, and then just get a cup or two of a, a, a bean you've never tried before, like a cranberry bean or an eye of the goat bean, or go into that grain section and pick up some farro for the first time or pearl barley. But don't buy the whole pound. Dry a little bit of it because then if you discover you love it, great, you can go back and get more, and you're going to pay so much less than if you bought it packaged um, on, you know, in the aisle of the grocery store or – you found out you didn't like it. Well, guess what? You're not going to have this like can this box of beans in your pantry for years that you never touch again. So right there, you're saving money. And I, um, the other thing is, you know, it's great for bulk cooking. Like I think that where people get in trouble, uh, especially people who have really hectic schedules and feel like they're too busy to cook, and and then they'll say, okay, I'm going to get on track this week, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to I got my grocery list, and I'm going to go and buy all of the ingredients for 21 meals at home. Well, most of us don't eat 21 meals at home. Right. And so if people really sat down and got realistic, but I always say the first step in, in grocery planning, making that list, isn't the 21 meals. It's opening up your calendar and saying, where am I this week? How many times will I be eating breakfast at home? How many lunches am I going to pack? How many dinners will I actually have at home? And once you figure that out and then you realize that you could make a couple of different kinds of beans or grains over the weekend – in just a couple of hours in the pressure cooker, you could have most of that ready to reheat and eat all week long. So not only did you save money at the grocery store, but you saved so much time. I mean, I, it and, really and, is a tool. And it freezes it's great. So, like, when I cook oh, my yeah. beans, we'll have it for dinner one night, and then I'll portion it out in, like, two-cup portions, and I'll freeze them. And so when I need a quick meal, I'm just pulling it out of the freezer. Yep. Exactly. Oh, they freeze great. Beans freeze amazing. And, um, you know, it's just the two of us in the house. And so some people also say, well, you know, it's just me or it's just me and my husband. The kids are gone or, 
and that they don't need to do that. And, you know, um, I will just I'll soak a, a cup or two of beans overnight, make my beans, and then I have a goal. Like, I know when I made them. If I made them on Sunday, I want to have them done. I want to eat them up by Wednesday. And if I haven't eaten them up by Wednesday, I pull out my food saver, I vacuum pack and suck all that air out, and lay it flat in my freezer. And I'm telling you, if something horrible happened and we weren't able to cook for a while, we'd be eating just fine because they right. freeze so well. And when you use those um, vacuum pack bags, they actually, they just don't take up that much space. You can, you know, I just, we live in a condo. I just have the bottom of the freezer of my refrigerator. And then, of course, because when I was writing the book, I made a lot of food. You know how that goes. And so I did buy one of those um, compact deep freezes I don't know if you've ever seen those and um we don't you know we don't have a basement or anything store in a condo but it fits right next to our car in the garage and it is a tiny little tiny little deep freeze that we got from Home Depot for like $170 I could stack uh, probably a year's worth of food in that thing so <laughs> so for people who want to you know it's, it's a nice it's a nice thing to have around how long do you recommend, like, do you think it lasts in the freezer, like, cooked beans and cooked rice, like, or in your opinion? I, cause, yeah, I, mm-hmm. yeah no, go ahead. Tell me what you're and I, You know, I figure, you know, three-month rule, that's me. I just, like, I figure, you know, if you don't eat it within three months, you know, it's probably not good. Same but, here. Yeah. Same, same here. I, um, I, I, I learned a couple of things. One is I need to mark the date on it. Um, so I have my little Sharpies in yep. the, um, next to my bag with the food saver. And I've also learned I actually need to write on the, what it is because I've had some unpleasant surprises. Like sometimes I think that I have thought <laughs> out something sweet, and it turns out it was incredibly savory and oh so wrong. <laughs> um, so my tip is to be sure to write on your bag what you froze or your jar or, or oh, however your story. I have, I, yeah. have, I have a story like that. I'm I'm 55 and I think I need glasses, but I'm too vain to get them. And I love to buy roasted spices that are already roasted because I'm too lazy to roast them. And McCormick has a brand of roasted spices that are delicious: cinnamon. Uh, they have the cinnamon, the cumin, the coriander, and the ginger, and they're delicious. And uh, so I have them. And I was making my overnight oatmeal, which calls for cinnamon, and accidentally I had cumin in there but I didn't know it until the next morning when I ate it and I'm telling you cumin and oatmeal not good not good <laughs> so, so I know what you mean about pulling out the wrong thing one of my favorite things and you it's funny because you you have a recipe in your book for this and you cook it a little bit differently than me but one of the things I love about a pressure cooker is I love kabocha squash I can eat the whole squash mm, sometimes mm-hmm. I do but it, they're they're so hard to, for me they're so hard to cut and they take so long to cook in the oven I mean you you have you you cook it for four minutes you have a cut in half I usually just put the whole thing in there for 10 but it's it's just amazing that you can have a kabocha squash even in 10 minutes I mean, how great is that? It's crazy. It is really amazing. Um, I love that with the squash. It makes really great spaghetti squash, too. And truthfully, I started, you know, when I, a lot of the things that I did with this book was, you know, so many people, many people are terrified of pressure cooking. Yeah, and what so, that is? Well, it's because those old pressure cookers, people have legitimate, terrible stories growing up. Like, they had grandmas who had split these suits that blew up, and there was – soup up on the ceiling or whatever. And, and so it's funny. I was at VegFest Colorado last week, and I had my, my display table, and I brought, actually brought one of my vintage pressure cookers, and I had it on the table, and I had it right next to a modern-day Fagor stovetop pressure cooker and a modern-day electric pressure cooker. And every time people come up to say, ooh, pressure cooking, I'm really scared. And then I would hold up the vintage one and said, you're scared of this. This mm-hmm. isn't what we use anymore. So let's set this aside, and now let me tell you how these work and look at all of these safety features. And so I think that that's why so many people come to pressure cooking demonstrations is because they really, really want to figure this out. They're scared of them. And so I had to keep that in mind when I was writing the book because I, you know, as you no, I'm not culinarily trained. I'm a home cook who, you know, I've taken some classes to try to get better at what I do and to focus on working with people who want to eat plant-based, but I don't have that culinary training. So what I tried to do was to not be something that I'm not when I wrote the book, A. And B, I kept reminding myself, put yourself in the place of somebody who's afraid. And so even though I know that a squash can cook whole, I wanted to take myself, like the, like I 
just thought of the person standing there going, there's no way this could work. This thing is going to blow up. So I would cut it in half and I would cook it. And if it works, then that's what I put in a book. Because I really wanted people to be like, okay, I could do that. I feel comfortable with that. So I did some things that aren't necessarily like culinarily genius, but I feel like are super user-friendly and, and trying to acknowledge who I think is sitting in front of their pressure cooker attempting this for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, but speaking of like – amazing like and that squash in a short period of time same with potatoes right like so you can take a whole potato and invert your steam basket so that it's sitting on way up high on top of that steam basket with some water in the pressure cooker and leave it whole so it's kind of like a baked potato Mm -hmm. except that it doesn't take an hour you didn't turn your oven on um it does take about 18 minutes but that's um, faster than an hour and it's only about 10 minutes more if it had been in your microwave but you didn't have to use your microwave to make your potato right, and right. then you can just put that in a bowl and slice it open and pour some of that chili oh your red lentil chili by the way over oh. um what I, my, oh. what I call my pressure cooked baked potatoes yep in my pressure cooker in one pressure cooker I'm making my baked potatoes and the other one I'm making your red lentil chili yep. and that is a match made in heaven it is that's my favorite recipe we're actually having it tonight over brown rice yeah oh uh, perfect uh, Delicious. Well, you know, and you have a, 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 a one of the recipes I made from your book that was also delicious, and you you, you got my attention when you said dessert for breakfast uh, was the apple mm. pie steel cut oats. And yeah. you know, I, I mean, steel cut oats are great; they're healthy, but they could take almost an hour to cook on the stove. I mean, I, yeah, I always say five minutes. You you have it cooked in in three minutes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and mm-hmm. delicious, yeah. by the way. Oh, thank you very much. I, I love making oats in, in the pressure cooker, and I've actually become obsessed with making savory oats now because I think that I get in a rut sometimes. Like, mm-hmm. oh, there'll be something I love, and I just eat it over and over and over again, and, yeah. over, and I'm like, all right, I need to break out of this. Yeah. So, um, so what I've been doing lately is taking the still cut oats, and I cook them in vegetable broth, and I'll add things like chili powder or onion and garlic, and then and maybe a little, in this case, maybe a little cumin. And I will, and, pump, and like pumpkin seeds, and then I'll sprinkle some nutritional yeast on it and do sort of a savory kind of thing. But I did want to mention with oats, and I'm sure you get this question sometimes too. There are, for those of you who are listening who are thinking about a pressure cooker, or I'll bet you some of you have a pressure cooker and you've never opened it. Because almost every demo I get on the book tour, I would ask that question and I'd tell people, I'd, I'd ask them, raise your hand if you have a pressure cooker. And the hands would go up and I'd say, keep your hands up. And now for those of you who have a pressure cooker and you've never used it, you keep your hands up and probably half of them did. Now, there are some things in your manual that are going to make you hesitant to do some things. And I certainly don't want to encourage you to do something that you shouldn't do. But let me just say that most pressure cooker manuals will say don't make oats in a pressure cooker. And the reason they're saying that is because... Think of when you're making steel cut oats or or rolled oats on the stove or if you've done it in the microwave. How many of us have watched them roll over the saucepan, right, or roll over the bowl? They do get foamy. Now imagine that happening in the pressure cooker. So the the reason they're telling you that is they don't want, you know, any of those oats to get lodged up in the steam valve of the lid of the pressure cooker. But all you need to do is just make sure you're using the right size. So you don't want to put a whole bunch of oats and a whole bunch of liquid in a small pressure cooker. The Instant Pot that you and I both have, and I have a Fagor, this is six quarts, the same size. If I just put a cup of steel cut oats in there for my husband and I for breakfast, we're not going to get anywhere near the top. And so Mm -hmm. you just need to really heed sort of the size. And remember that with oats, you want to use, make sure you're using a small amount of oats to that large, um, to to, to the size of the, you know, go, go with the six quart pressure cooker if you have that and the other thing is the pressure cooker manual say that oil is required to make beans and that's not true that's not true that's one of the things i appreciated about your book jl is as you know i work for a lot of the medical doctors in the plant-based movement and i teach up at true north where we're just absolutely not allowed to use not only oil but sugar or salt and your recipes really even the ones that have it you know a teaspoon it's not that much and it can easily be omitted but it's not true because i've never used oil in my pressure cooker and everything comes out exactly well the reason that they used to say that was because a couple of things one beans can foam and so there, there, it's a safety perspective. There, it, it's because a, a lot of people when they do add oil, it's usually for flavor, right? And in this case, that's not what it's there for. They're trying to prevent a bean or a skin from a bean getting lodged up in, in the in the steam valve. And so the way that kind of the, the way conventional wisdom was saying was to drizzle once you put your beans in your water and drizzle 
oil over it. But you don't need to for a couple of reasons. One, even though you don't have to soak your beans overnight in a pressure cooker, if you have the time and you remember what kind of bean you want to have tomorrow night, soak the beans. Because in my humble opinion, if I have the difference, which first off, they're going to cook up much quicker than an hour and a half, two hours, or three hours, or even four or five if you live as high as I live at 6,000 feet. Um, they're going to cook quicker if they're dry, but they're going to cook even more quickly if you soak them overnight. And I think they, they, there's a creaminess in them that is just a little bit different. And I think, you know, we, so when you soak them overnight, you're, you're getting rid of some of that gas, and therefore you're getting rid of some of that foaming that might have happened. So that's one thing. But the other thing is it just kind of goes back to size. When you look at your pressure cooker, look inside and look to see where that max line is, M-A-X for maximum. That's there for a reason. They're trying yeah. to keep things away from the lid. And so, um, so you don't need oil to keep the skin out. You just need to pressure cook responsibly. Use the right quantity of beans or oats, if that's what you're making, so that you can avoid anything getting sort of lodged up, you know, like a loose piece of skin or something. So I just wanted to bring that up just to tell people that you might read that in your manual. Right. Don't you know put those very hot. I've never read the manual, so I don't even. I just, I just don't have time, and I just, I just figure out, you know, I'll figure out. I push the button. That's why when people say to me, write a book. I mean, and and with all due respect to people, and I'm glad that you and Jill and and Lorna have written these books because I really didn't feel like it. I just throw stuff in. I mean, it always works. I throw it in. I push a button, and my feeling is, if it didn't come out, I add more time. I mean, I I don't think it's rocket science. I don't think people should just be so afraid. You can take a recipe that you have, and I, I mean, tell me your opinion. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong how did you do these recipes like did you take recipes that you already made on a pot in a stove and then just convert them or or no nope. you- I'm with you I played and I and it's so funny that you asked this question because this is actually one of the things I really wanted to encourage your listeners um today is to you know get playful in the kitchen that's how you created your recipes right chef AJ you yeah. like, you take you take foods that you love and you take a risk, and you get adventurous, and you get playful. And truthfully, with pressure cooking, that is exactly what I did with this book. But here's my little insider tip, and this is going to help all of you. If you're looking at your pantry right now, and you have a stack of jars filled with beans and grains that you have not cooked through, here's my challenge for you. Find a pressure cooker book, anybody, you know, anybody's pressure cooking book. Online, there's lots of charts. Look for a cooking chart. And what you want to do is look for grain cooking times and bean cooking times and start to mix and match beans and grains that cook at about the same time. That is a really fun way to make that, one pot meals. That is a great right. tip because we have a couple of questions from the people um, that, that listen to the show. And one of them from Tracy was, would love to hear some pressure cooking tips and tricks. And this is a great one because I, I, I never thought about that, trying to mash them up a little bit better. But that I always just took the thing that cooked the longest and make that the time. But this is even better to try to coordinate them, you know, because, for instance, like if you're putting kale in it, you generally don't put it in the beginning. You do it at the very end because that cooks so exactly. quickly. So that, yeah. that, is a, that is a great tip. Oh, good. And, you know, I, I, I'll, t- I'll tell you, that's where you also think about soaking versus unsoaking. Um, I was doing a demo at Whole Foods a couple of months ago, and I'd asked my friend there to get all of the ingredients ready and to soak the beans overnight, or so I thought I had asked that. And it turns out the day of, I called, and I'm like, are we all set? And she's like, yep, and you'll be bringing the soaked beans, right? And I'm like, uh-oh. So the plan had been, because it was a Whole Foods grocery store, really fast demo, we were going to do soaked navy beans, which will cook in six, six to seven minutes, white rice, which cooked in about six to seven minutes, and kale. Well, the beans weren't soaked. So I just pulled out my handy-dandy chart, and I looked at unsoaked navy beans, which were going to cook in about 22 to 24 minutes, although I live at, or was cooking at 6,000 feet elevation. And if you want me to get into that later, I will. When you're at elevation, that yeah. the only thing you have to change with pressure okay. cooking our bean cooking time. So I knew I need a little bit more time. So then I knew, well, brown rice cooks in about 22 minutes. So that's what I'll do. So on the fly, I'm like, okay, we're fine. Just bring me brown rice instead of white rice, and we're going to use dry beans. And so, so yeah, so that's how you can really get playful. Just find a bean. And and, and you could look at a a farro, and you could go, oh, farro cooks up in 10 minutes in the pressure cooker. So what kind of bean do I want? You have so many choices. A, you could use a lentil because there is no soaking involved, and those are going to take 8 to 10 minutes. So lentils and farro are perfect together. And truthfully, when you make them together, it almost comes out a little bit like a a really nice, healthy risotto. But also so many beans, if you soak them overnight, 
will cook beautifully in that sort of eight to 10 minute range. And so that is a really fun way to cook your way through your pantry. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, at least I've heard this from a lot of people that it also it's, you know, of course you can cook your beans unsoaked and it will take longer, but that it increases the digestibility a little bit for people that get a lot of gas to have them soaked. Exactly. Yeah. That's the other reason I always tell people, because um, I have so many people who, some people in the room are vegan and some people aren't. And I'm like, listen, I feel like my stomach's a tank. It's never met a bean now that it can't take on, digest, and just like spit back out. It's like, we, we can handle the beans and you can. You've been eating them for 40 years, right? But for yeah. those in our family or that we're cooking for who are like beans, we're only like canned, you know, pork and beans, right? They didn't really eat beans before. Forget the fact that you don't want to soak your beans because, you know, whatever. You, you like the idea that you can cook them dry. Do it for your loved ones. Let them not have gas tonight. Yeah. Just soak your beans. And, and um, I learned this from some of the <laughs> The macrobiotic chefs to just put like a one inch piece of kombu in as well. Yes. That's supposed to help yes. as well a little bit with with that. So I, I love yep. that you even have a recipe with canned beans because this 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 I haven't made this, but I you know I, when I go through a book I always take my little post its and then you know like I put the what I want to make and I have yeah. several <laughs> books. Um, one of the ones I want to make that I didn't make was your red lentil stew because that looked delicious. But the black beans and yams, every ingredient that you have, four ingredients: diced yams. Yep. Cause I always have yams or sweet potatoes, vegetable broth, always have it in my freezer since you taught me how to make it so quickly, salsa, prepared salsa, always have that, and I always have a can of beans, four minutes, I mean, you have a delicious dinner. Yep, yep, and I did that on purpose because I wanted people to think, oh my gosh, I'm just not that person, I'm not the person that's going to have dried beans in my house, and and I, I my hope is that as they read the book and get used to it, that they'll start to do that, but in the meantime, I might not have soaked beans last night, or I might not have some dried beans, and I can come home and still... Take a vegetable, take a beautiful, beautiful potato, and just dice it up and throw it in with some prepared foods. And in minutes, I've got a, a meal that is flavorful. And and I really did want to add, have a few things where we used canned beans just to make it easy, very accessible to people. Is what I wanted. Right, right. Do you have a preference between stovetop and electric? I mean, I'm, I don't have a stovetop because you know I don't have a, I don't have an I have an electric oven. So I just, I never bothered getting a stovetop one also because when I travel and do demos, I can't cook, you know, with a stovetop one in my hotel room and being a dog lover, having a dog, it's just so much easier to do the electric because I put everything in. I walk the dog while it's cooking. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I I learned on a stovetop and if I'm going to be in my kitchen, like really in my kitchen and I'm, I'm in there to like have a good old time and make all kinds of things, I've got both my stovetop and my electric going. Um, I really like electric for grains because, as you know, grains can be tricky sometimes. I've never, I've never opted for that insert. Like there, there are people who have instructions like to put like a bowl or something on a trivet and make their grains in that. So it's almost like they're steamed rice, which is what a rice cooker would do anyway. I don't do that, but, um, but I, I like how my electric pressure cooker does. But truthfully, I choose between the two of them depending on what's happening in that moment. Meaning. If I'm in the kitchen and I'm really going for it, so I'm like, you know, a little Betty Crocker, I'll, I'll, I'll use the stovetop. If I'm running around like a mad woman in the morning because I'm trying to get things ready, I've got to get to the office, I'm doing this or that, I want that electric pressure cooker because I can set it and forget it. And if I walked out of the house and forgot that it was on, no problem. It right. just moves exactly. over to warm. Exactly. You know? It's like a crock yeah. And I love it because if you're going to a potluck, it's so great because you just unplug it and you go, you know. Exactly, exactly. So I think that, and, and that's when we, when I think when people are on the fence about which one to get, I think think about um, price points because you really can get some nice stovetop pressure cookers for no more than like 45 or 50 Wow. Bucks. So that's, you know, that that's not a, that, that's, that's a good way if you're like, oh, I'm a little nervous. What if I don't like doing this? I don't want to spend a lot of money. That's one way to experiment. And then if you, if you fall in love with pressure cooking like I did, well, then go out later and buy the electric, and now you've got two. So you could be making a bean and a grain at the exact same time, and 30 minutes later you cooked food for the week, you know, in 30 minutes. So, well, so it's no harm, no foul. But um, did I think electric really does have a place for so many people who have, are leading such busy lives right now? I don't know anybody that that actually has one not, that used it that didn't fall in love with it. You know, there are people exactly. that have them that don't use them. But once you use them, I mean, it simplifies your life so much. You get, especially if you have a family, especially if you work or busy, you get meals on the on the table so fast. All the meals, steel cut oats and less than five for breakfast, you know, dinners in, in less than 20 for sure, sometimes even. I mean, quinoa takes a minute in the pressure cooker. I know. It's not crazy. It is. I, um, 
I love the quinoa. Um, I always talk, cause for people who haven't used a pressure cooker yet, it's a little deceiving, you know, when we do talk about time, though. Like if a, if a lentil says 8 to 10 minutes, there's more time than that. First sure. of all, the, the device has to come up to pressure. Then you count the time, 8 to 10 minutes, and then you allow it to come down for pressure. So I had a friend who was teasing me about quinoa because I'd always say, quinoa in one minute. And she's like, listen. At the end of the day, I can make quinoa on my stovetop, and it's probably going to be done at the exact same time, to which I say to her, that's right, but here's the difference. You're going to go into your kitchen, heat up your water in your saucepan, add your quinoa, put a lid on, set it aside later, fluff it, and do all these things to it. I put it in my electric pressure cooker with vegetable broth or water, Uh close the lid, push the one button. I go upstairs, I take my shower, put my makeup on, I feed the cat, I get my bags ready for work. I go out and I get the mail, and I come in, and I'm like, ah, voila, it's done. So did it happen? Did it take the exact same amount of time? Probably. But you know what? I win because I got like 20 things done during Exactly. So it's not just time. It's convenience, too. And one of the things that's so cool is, have you ever done corn on the cob in a pressure cooker? Oh, yeah. The milks just melt off. You you, you cook it. I mean, just... I don't know. I can't. I mean, I cannot say enough for this. So you know, you you got. I keep thinking about what you're saying about your savory oat recipe. Are these on your blog? Because those sound fantastic. Yeah, I've been putting them on the blog. I don't think I have one in this in the book. And I think that was kind of my rebellion after the book was done. I was like, I need like, <laughs> I want to make some things that aren't in my book. And so I do have some on my website, jlgoesvegan.com. If you look for um, savory oats. Or also, if you go to my website under recipes and just choose pressure cooking, I think I have 75 pressure cooking recipes on You're my website. You're kidding. So. That's amazing. Well, wow, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Now, now, have you ever had oat groats? Because those are delicious in the pressure cooker. I love them. Yeah. It, I it's almost tastes like, it almost tastes like rice. I, I love them. My friend Sharon McRae made them for me when I was in Baltimore last month. And these are delicious. Yeah, they're really good. And that is the thing. Are you bringing up such a great point because you're bringing up these different kinds of oats? I think that we can sometimes, we can kind of get into a rut. And one of the reasons I want people to play around with beans and grains is to remind themselves, you know, when we choose to follow a plant-based diet or a vegan diet, and some people think we gave up so much, I'm like, are you kidding me? I have eaten foods I've never even yeah. heard of before. Exactly. Back when I was yeah. eating exactly. Meat. It's so many choices. So if you ever feel like you're getting bored or you're eating the same thing, remember, that's what's happening for you. That doesn't mean there aren't lots of options out there. And pressure cooking is a great way to play around with beans and grains you've never even heard of before. Because then, you know, you don't, you're not spending your life in the kitchen. It just takes a little bit to try it. And then you really get to have some culinary fun. So you mentioned about the cooking times in the chart. Is there one chart that you prefer that you use? Like, do you have it, like, printed out in your kitchen on your counter so that you can see it? Or do you have most of this memorized? Or You know, it's funny. I actually don't. I'm really bad with memory. So, you know, I have my own book on the, you know, up, popped up just so that, because I know what times work for me. Now, and let me tell you what I mean by that, though. My book is written for sea level. I always tell people, when you buy a recipe or a cookbook, assume it's been written at sea level unless it's called the Happy High Altitude Cooking Book or something, <laughs> right? I mean, so, um, so my chart, what I have is I have handwritten all over it because I live at um, – so, so with beans and cooking times in the pressure cooker, you have to add cooking time once elevation increases. So I live at 6,200 feet, and the formula is – once you hit 3,000 feet, you need to add 5% cooking time to beans. For every 1,000 feet after that, you add another 5%. So I add 20% to cooking time. So my chart in my, my kitchen, I have marked out the times on the chart, and I've added my elevation cooking times. And I tell people that if you're not writing all over cookbooks, then you're breaking all of our hearts, those of us who write books, because actually we want you to write all. Make this yours. Like figure yeah. out what you like. Mm-hmm. Cross out the spice you hate. Add the spice you love. Cross out the time that we suggested because the time that it actually takes is the one that matters in your kitchen. And so, um, but I will tell you that there are a couple of charts I love. Jill's obviously um, in her book, The New Fast Food. I refer to that a lot. And then um, actually, Laura, I can never pronounce Laura's last name. She's Italian. She has a, a, a website called Hip, H I P, as in hipster, hippressurecooking.com. Not a vegan website, just FYI, so don't yell yeah. at me when you go over there. Sure. But um, not you, I miss it. And yeah. <laughs> um, there's going to be all kinds of things there. But I have found her chart, her times work really, really well for me. I mean, obviously, I still have to add my, my bean cooking time. And I, I clipped hers 
and have them in my Evernote. So actually when I have my iPad or my iPhone in the kitchen, I can pull up the app Evernote and I've got a cooking chart right on my device. And oh, that's so great. That's, that's really handy, yeah. And, and, and the thing is I found it except for vegetables, which get too mushy, you don't. You can't really ruin things like grains and beans. And if anything, you you tend to undercook them. You just add more time. It's not. It's not exactly. a big deal. It's not a big deal. So I have to ask yeah. you, just because you are JL and I am AJ. We are initials. <laughs> are we allowed to know? Are we allowed to know what it stands for? Oh yeah, absolutely. My name is Jerry Lynn. Okay, um, that's great. And the only only reason I'm JL, everyone thinks, ooh, you wrote a book, so you're JL. I'm like, no, 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 no. This happened in the '90s. When I was working at an organization, a nonprofit in Chicago, an email happened, and my colleague one day, she said, girl, I am done typing out Jerry Lynn. You are J-L. And so <laughs> e- e- email made my name J-L. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, I became, I became AJ before I was actually Chef AJ because in 2003 when I changed my diet from a really junky vegan diet where I was just basically eating dessert all day to a more health-promoting one, I started by going to Jamba Juice every morning for breakfast since from when I got out of OHI. And the, it was so noisy there with the blenders. And they'd go, what's your name? And I'm go, Abby. What? Abby. They couldn't hear me. So they'd go, AJ. And so then yeah. people started calling me AJ. And, you know, and what was great, though, is because when I graduated culinary school, most of the jobs I applied for were online. And they thought I was a guy, which I think actually worked in my favor because I think women are still a little bit discriminated against in the world. I think world. you're right. So mm-hmm. be Chef AJ, because then I get there and go, oh, we thought you were a guy. And I'm like, well, just taste the food, you know, that kind of yeah, thing. Exactly. So, that was good. so um, <laughs> I, when you do your demos, which is quite a bit, especially now that you're a PCRM instructor, do you use the electric or do you use the stovetop or do you not use a pressure cooker when you're doing culinary demos? You know, actually, it depends. I use, I use this. This is what I tell anybody who's a chef or anybody who does teach cooking classes. That's reason enough to get a pressure cooker, right? Because yeah. the prep time. So I, when I'm doing a class, especially like PCRM, because, of course, those recipes don't call for pressure cooking, I use my pressure cookers at home to do my food prep. So my beans are done. I'm not, I don't have to buy canned beans. I can make them. I can make the grains and make them in a matter of minutes because teaching cooking classes takes so much time from the prep side. So just from a preparatory side of, of teaching a class, I have found them incredi- incredibly useful. But I always bring my electric with me because when people are sitting there and I tell them what I'm cooking and, and they get really interested and excited and they're thinking about this. And I say to them, listen, if there's one thing you want, you're thinking you want to add to your kitchen, there are going to be people who tell you you need a dehydrator. There are no. going to be people who tell you you need a $400 blender, which, by no. the way, I'm not opposed to them. I have one too. Me but too. I, say, I, have, I have a food <laughs> dehydrator and a $400 blender, but I'm telling you, if there was a fire, I would I'd grab the pressure cooker. <laughs> That's the exactly. one of Exactly. can't live without. Exactly. My dehydrator pretty much holds all of my winter um, – socks and everything up I turned it into a dresser drawer so I don't use my dehydrator <laughs> my blender of course I do use but I tell people you you know you, yes you could make some amazing things in that blender but the truth is every staple that you want to eat as a plant you know eating plant-based you can make sure. in the pressure Absolutely. cooker this, this, this is your device vegetables yeah vegetables, rice yep. beans, even, even fruit so we have a question from Lisa and she said that she's going to be doing her first food demo and providing samples in just a few days and had uh-huh. no idea how strict the requirements imposed by the health department were regarding washing rinsing sanitizing and cooking utensils separate hand yeah. washing stations as well as keeping samples covered before giving them out um so she understands there must be regulations, but she wants to know how you deal with doing food demos and giving out samples in various locations. Does mm. the organizer of the event take care of all that? I think every I think every place is different, honestly. Yeah, every state is different. Every county is different. I mean, I worry mostly on on my own home base, you know. And so in and so so what I would say is start with where you live and where you you think you'll be doing most of these demos and find out what your local laws are. So for me in Colorado, I know that I need a food handling um, certificate, which I have. Uh-huh. I know that I can't, I can't sell my food because um, we don't allow cottage um, food uh, practices. And I carry liability insurance, which covers my home kitchen as well as my office as a cooking school. So I am allowed to uh, prepare food and to give out samples for food. And so, yeah. so that, that works there. Um, but, you know, I was on a book tour, and I, I did, you know, almost 40 events um, all over the country over six months, and I really just relied on my local organizers to, to be concerned uh-huh. with that or, you know, the libraries or whatever, because there's just no way I'd be able to manage what the municipalities or counties would want for all of these different places. What was your favorite uh, place that you went on your book tour? 
Oh, there were so many incredible moments, but I got to tell you, I don't know if you know of Bonnie Goodman in Montana. She's the woman who has a, a, a potluck in Livingston, Montana, which is in the middle of ranching lands. And oh, cool. she has been, she's been doing a monthly vegan potluck for years. And she, she hosted me. I, I flew to Montana and she drove me across the state of Montana. And over 10 days, I did 13 events. And in, in cattle country, and it was amazing. Probably one of the most profound experiences I've had as a as a vegan professional. It was it was so rewarding. It was amazing. That's that's terrific. So if somebody buys your book, Vegan Pressure yep. Cooking, which I really recommend, the pictures are beautiful. By the way, did you shoot those oh. yourself? No, I wish. Kate Lewis, the beautiful, amazing photographer, Kate Lewis, who also did Fran Costigan's most recent chocolate book. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're beautiful pictures. So so somebody buys vegan pressure cooking, and they're, maybe they're yep. new to pressure cooking. What recipe do you think they should make first? What Or one, one or two that you think they really think, that, you know, so that they can realize how great pressure cooking is, and they're going to love it. What Which two oh. do you recommend from your book? I love this question. It is the, the, it's the two recipes that I did on the entire book tour. Oh, great. Want, which one? Yes. I want you to make the umami anasazi beans Ooh. and the mushroom rice. The, the mushroom umami, rice is really interesting. Have you, yeah. yeah. You know what that was? You know how it is. I'm at like, I'm supposed to have 105 recipes and I'm on like recipe number 77 and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have recipe block. What am I going to do? Uh-oh. And so I just started sauteing shiitake mushrooms and threw in long brown rice, threw in some veggie broth, and then just didn't use any salt. I just used tamari when I was done, yeah. and we devoured it. Um, but these umami anasazi beans, I wanted – my dad made ham and beans for us on Sundays in the winter growing up, and I wanted a food memory. And so I started to think about different ways that you, you know, could bring in really those umami elements of having a sense of savory satiety from a plant, right? So it's packed with – um, caramelized onions, soaked anasazi beans, it's uh, paprika, liquid smoke. You stir in red miso at the end. You add low sodium tamari at the end. So there's no added salt in this. And you bring the two of them together and those chunky pieces of chewy shiitake mushrooms gives you that sort of sense of a meatiness and the smell from the liquid smoke and the paprika and the miso it's like, I, I call it my omni-pleasing um, dish. It's what I mean. Uh, I teach a class called um, Cooking Vegan for Your Omnivore Family, and that is my signature dish because I think anybody sitting around the table, regardless of what they think about eating vegan food, they'll just devour it because it's good. Yeah. And that's why I did it on the, on the demo because most of the people are on the tour because most of the people coming to my demos were not vegan, and sure. I wanted them to have something that, they remember that rec- that they recognize. So well, those would be the two I would highly recommend. It's almost dinner time here, and I'm telling you, my mouth is watering. I love <laughs> I love how passionate you are, not just about your pressure cooking, but about your recipes. And so the the blog. What what recipe should we make on your blog? Uh, it, say the name of your blog again, in case people want to get oh, with you. My blog is jlgoesvegan.com. Mm-hmm. And um, gosh, on my recipe section under the, you know, I think I have um, my easy Spanish rice might be on there. Um, and if it's not, you guys tweet me or something and I'll make sure to get it up there. But I have a really cheaters version on the Spanish rice. But I would say try those savory oats. I think for anybody. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, that sounds yeah. amazing because I'm always getting yeah. requests for savory oats because not everybody wants to start their day with sweets. So that that's fantastic. So exactly. we know that you, you became vegan literally, you know, after a, a date with a goat. But who inspired you in general? I mean, are there people in the plant-based movement or just they don't have to be in a plant-based movement. But I always like to ask everybody I interview who inspires them the most in life. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, um, I think that we all probably have, like, evolved, and, and not to just pick one person, but I will say, and, and then I'll also give some dis- disclosure, but I started listening to the, um, the podcast, Our Hen House, with Jasmine Singer and Marianne Sullivan, mm-hmm. and I, start, I started listening to it about a year after I went vegan, and I feel like listening to them helped me uh, make a connection to everything, uh, food, environment, and the animals in a way that I don't think I would have been able to do on my own because through their podcast, they introduced me to so much. And now they're personal friends, and, and I'm on their board of directors now. But wow. I'm, not, I'm, I'm seriously not saying that because I'm on the board. Oh, that's, but how, so, do we, 
I, I love I love other people's podcasts. So what is the name of this podcast and how do we access it? They sound like interesting it's, people to interview. I love that kind of stuff. Oh my God, Chuck AJ, you'd love them. Oh, so so yeah. the podcast is called Our Hen House. O U R <laughs> Hen House, and the and the website is ourhenhouse.org, dot org. O R G. And um, Marianne is an animal law professor, and Jasmine has been an animal rights activist for years. In fact, Jasmine's um, memoir is coming out. That's reason enough. Um, yeah. Day for you to interview her. She wrote a piece for, I think it was Mind Green, Mind Body Green, one of those those websites, about losing 100 pounds and still feeling like that woman who had the 100 pounds in a room and how people treated her. Wow. And she got a book deal and she wrote a memoir about it. It's coming out in February. What's the and, name? Um, that sounds really interesting. What's that called? Um, I don't, I can't believe I can't remember the name of it. I'm so sorry. Um, That's okay. But, but her name is oh, Jasmine? Okay. Jasmine Singer, S-I-N-G-E-R. You would love her. I'm going to, if you want, let me know. I'll connect yeah, I, lo- I you love, I know. just, I just love, inter- yeah. I love interviewing interesting people, passionate people, plant-based yep. people primarily. Not everybody I interview is. So, so the last question, because I, I hate to be controversial on, I mean, I am controversial in life, but I like to be less controversial on healthy living because I like to yeah. respect all my guests, and not all of them are vegan. How do you think we can bridge? I don't know if there's really a gap, but there. I, I've been vegan for 40 years, so obviously, when I was 17, I did not become vegan for health reasons because I was right. obese and I smoked cigarettes, so I wasn't doing it for health. So obviously, I'm an ethical vegan at heart. But right. I got a health. I got. I, I got sick. I got very fat. I got very sick at the beginning of cancer, and I changed my diet for health reasons. But a lot of people that are just ethical vegans, I've heard them say, well, if you're not vegan for ethical reasons, don't be vegan. But the last time I checked, the cows and the pigs didn't really care why we weren't eating them. So how can we right. – I'm, I'm going to Summerfest in a couple of weeks, and I, I guess I kind of feel like Rodney King. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a, a – Oh, guy. yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he, he's passed away, but the L.A. riots were incited because of him. But he ended up saying, well, can't we all just get along? And, and right. And I'd like to see that too because I, I mean the thing is is if you're going vegan for health reasons it doesn't mean you're you hate animals and eventually these people become more ethical vegans so how can we just you know because to me veganism is about kindness and compassion for all life forms even humans so how can right. we all get along that's that's what I want to end on well that's a, that's a great question and boy I wish I had the answer but I you know <laughs> but I've got an opinion and yeah. and because you know that you know my perspective is. Um, this is what I think. I think that a lot of times when we think we found the right way, kind of like with veganism, right? We we want everybody to see it. Um, and I think that if we broke down from like groups or labels, like I feel like sometimes WFPB people will say, well, I'm WFPB. I'm whole food plant-based to like make the distinction of like, I'm not vegan. And I think that hurts vegan feelings. Like somehow, you know, oh, well, because you don't identify WFPB, therefore you are a junk food vegan. Where the the truth of the matter is, there are probably far more of us who are somewhere right, somewhere smack dab in between. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we, we, you know, like I love to eat healthy, delicious food, and I will never apologize for eating a vegan cupcake because they're delicious. <laughs> um, and so, but I don't eat them every day. That's not my diet. But it's easy, it would be easy to judge me. And I think if we broke out of like I belong to this group or this is how I identify myself and just look at the individual in front of you and treated them with the exact respect that you would want treated and, and try to pull away from the labels instead of say, okay, cool, you're coming to it from this way and I'm coming to it from this way. And the outcome is the same. We didn't eat an animal today. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. and, um, and, and the health outcome may not be the same, but who are we to, you know, like I, I think that like some of that, that imposition on others is probably where some of the, some of that lies. But I think, from any one of us, whatever our perspective is, it's very easy to get into crowd mentality and be on a team that has a label and everyone feels really empowered around it. And we forget to treat the individual in front of us as the singular person that they are, the individual that they are. And I think if we treat people that way, it will, I I think that could really help. You know, and and from my perspective, JL, there's no bad reason to go vegan. So I don't really even care what the vegan (laughs) reason is. Because at the end of the day, they're eating less animals and they're still improving their health. 
So yeah. that, that was a great, I loved your answer. And I love talking to you and I love your passion. I love your book. So please go out and get Vegan Pressure Cooking and check out the website, www.jlgoesvegan.com and try those savory oats. I know I'm going to do that. So it's been just a pleasure talking to you. It went so quickly as it always it does. Did. And but it did. Thank just, you so, so much. It's, almost, it's always easier talking to people that have cookbooks than doctors because I speak the same language. <laughs> yeah. so, and, and, and we both yeah. have the same passion for it. And we, so, and we uh, both have initials instead of names. Exactly. The cool okay. people are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Thanks, JL, and good night, everyone.